Hello and welcome to Off the Cast episode 1 14 December 2015. Today we touch upon a very common and a very less comprehended topic in the world of clinical optics. I know that a lot of residents and medical students can write long long answers on this topic but always wonder why we study this. Optics? No, why again? I thought I left it behind in school when I was done with physics. Optics, a necessary evil of ophthalmology. The evil step brother. Like Sturm's conoid, a classic description of light refraction in a spherocylindrical lens. Remember the days we used to make ray diagrams of concave and convex lenses in our high school days? Sturm's conoid just takes it a step further. So today I'll try to explain to you Sturm's conoid and make sense of it in a practical point of view. Later in this chapter we'll also try to guide you step by step on how to demonstrate one with simple tools. It was the year 1697 when a German philosopher scientist and optical experimenter Johann Christoph Sturm published a book named Physica Elective Save Hypothetica. This book contained something that became a part of ophthalmology curriculum for many many years and still continues. He wrote about the refraction patterns of light rays across a spherocylindrical lens and we still continue to write long long paragraphs with annotated diagrams with it. Human eye is a complex refractive apparatus, what we call a compound lens system. Due to various factors, the refractive power of the cornea or the lens are not the same in all meridians. Just imagine a rugby ball. In one axis, it's more curved than the other. In an emetropic eye, these effects of the cornea and the crystalline lens is in opposite meridians. Hence, they cancel each other, giving a good refracting medium. Now, let's come back to Stern's conoid. To understand it better we need to see it because seeing is believing. You need a few things to demonstrate Stern's conoid. So head to the loose lens rack and grab a plus 12 spherical and plus 6 cylindrical lens. So how do I identify them? Spherical lens are those mostly with the handle and the cylindrical ones are the clean round ones. You will also find one line across in the cylindrical lens to indicate its axis. Now you need a light source. The light should not be too divergent. You can use a fiber optic point light. Easiest to grab is the pocket ophthalmoscope that any ophthalmology resident will be carrying. I personally find the ophthalmoscope the easiest to get your hands on. Thirdly, you require to find a flat wall preferably light colored now let's come to the first step follow these steps carefully and systematically as i speak to understand it better position your light in such a way that it's about a meter from the wall and gives a near perfect circular light on the wall ensure that the ophthalmoscope doesn't fall you know it's expensive Now hold the two lenses with their surfaces in contact. This becomes your compound lens. In this compound lens system, you have a refracting medium with plus 12 diopter power in one axis and plus 18 diopter in its perpendicular axis. Introduce your compound lens in the light beam near the light source and notice the light on the wall. Slowly move the lens complex towards the wall from the light source. Notice the refracted light on the wall. The light will start getting smaller as you move towards the wall. Now, notice the shape of the refracted light. The shape is oval. Keep moving towards the wall and a point will be reached when you will get a line of focus. The line of focus will be along the line on the cylindrical lens you are holding. Move further to the wall and there comes a point when the light is a perfect circle. This is the point where you have achieved the circle of least confusion. Continue your stride towards the wall. 
Slowly, the circle becomes a line of focus again. But this time, the line is perpendicular to the first line. Notice the relation of these lines to the marks on the cylindrical lens that you are holding. As you continue, the line of focus becomes an oval again. But the long axis of this oval will be perpendicular to the long axis of the previous oval. Voila! You have successfully recreated the experiment done by Johann Christoph Sturm in 1960s. Now let's think back. With the lens configuration that you were holding, never will you get the best point focus. So in an optical system with different refracting powers in different meridians, there are two lines of focus and one point of least confusion and absolutely no stage where there is a pinpoint focus. The entire ray arrangement which is in the three-dimensional shape of a conoid that is something like a cone but not is called the legendary Sturm's conoid. The interval between the two focal lines is called the interval of Sturm. The lens configuration held by you is somewhat equivalent to an astigmatic eye. This is the reason which causes a decreased visual acuity in astigmatism. There is no actual point focus. Okay, now we manage to do a lot of gimmicks. What next? Imagine an eye where the horizontal and vertical curvature of the cornea differs drastically. Where will the light rays focus? We know that in a regular eye with myopia, the light focuses ahead of the retina and hyperopia the light focuses behind the retina. In the astigmatic cornea with a refraction akin to the compound lens that you are holding, there isn't an actual point where the light is focused but a long interval. The retina can lie within or outside this limit. This is where the terms like myopic and hyperopic astigmatism comes to play. We know that myopia is a condition where the light rays are focused anterior to the retina and hyperopia or hypermetropia is where the light rays are focused behind the retina. So now let's discuss some very simple definitions. First, myopic astigmatism. In myopic astigmatism, the complete complex of foci lie anterior to the retina. If the first line of focus lies anterior to the retina, but the second line of focus lies on the retina, it is subtyped as simple myopic astigmatism. In eyes where all the foci lie completely anterior to the retina is called compound myopic astigmatism. Now let's talk about hyperopic astigmatism. In hyperopic astigmatism, the complete focus is behind or posterior to the retina. If the first line of focus lies on the retina, but the second line of focus is posterior to the retina, it is subtyped as simple hyperopic astigmatism. In eyes where all the foci lie completely posterior to the retina, it is called compound hyperopic astigmatism. Lastly, if one line of focus lies anterior to the retina and the other posterior to the retina, it is called mixed astigmatism. Now try imagining. In mixed astigmatism, you have to push the first line of focus more posterior and pull the second line of focus more anterior. That means you need to reduce the dioptric power of the lens in one meridian and increase it in another meridian. When you translate it into prescription, you will find a patient who requires minus lens in one meridian and plus in the other. Now, let me ask you a question. In our experiment with plus 12 diopter spherical and plus 6 cylinder, if the patient has a simple myopic astigmatism, what will be the power required to correct the refractive error? Think. Try thinking. I believe you should be able to figure it by now. Okay, my turn to give the solution. When I say simple myopic astigmatism, 
the second line of focus lies on the retina. Our task at hand is to bring the first line of focus also on the retina. The first line of focus corresponds to the arithmetic sum of both the lenses that we used. That makes it plus 18 diopter. The second line of focus corresponds to the plus 12 diopter spherical lens. Since the second line of focus is perpendicular or opposite as I call to the axis of the cylindrical lens. Now we will have to bring down the dioptric power of the first line to plus 12 so that the first line also falls on the retina. 18 minus 12 gives you 6. Therefore we need to give this patient a minus 6 cylindrical lens in the corneal plane in the meridian of the first line of focus so that the first line of focus is shifted onto the retina. Such an addition will give you point focus on the retina instead of line focus. Corneal plane. We will discuss this very interesting topic in our later future episodes. It's a C in itself, trust me. Now the question. What happens if the cornea is not a regular oval as a rugby ball? What happens if the long and short axes are not perpendicular to each other? In those cases, ladies and gentlemen, nearly everything I told you now remains same, except the relation between the lines of focus to each other in terms of their axes. Great! I believe I might have done some justice to the topic and helped you look at Sturm's conoid in a different but practical perspective. Watch out for our next upcoming episode on axial distances of the eye. Let us know your feedback and questions, if any, on episode 1, Sturm's Conoid. Our email ID is offthecast at the rate gmail.com. Till then, goodbye and Godspeed.